Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today on Plant Your Seed, joining us from upstate New York, we have Francis Gonzalez. Francis is the founder and president of Vegan Wines, a completely vegan-friendly wine club, and Despacito Distributors, a plant-based wine distributing company. Welcome, Francis. Thank you, Fred, and hello, everyone. Thanks for being here on Plant Your Seed. Now, for our listeners, I would love to start with wine. One would think that it's just grapes and therefore obviously vegan, but there's a lot more to it than that. Can you explain what makes a wine vegan or not vegan? Yes, definitely. Wines, you know, we all, a lot of us think, okay, grapes, yes. Uh, But there's a lot of up to 64 ingredients can go into a wine legally. And we start at the fertile, at the soil. So in the soil, you can have animal manure, you know, part of the fertilizer, and it's biodynamic that has cow horns and the manure in the soil. And also fish fertilizers are used a lot in the wine industry. And then in the making of the wine uh, is the filtering. So in order, you, you have these settlements um, in your wine. So you might see them sometimes it's a little cloudy, and then when you look at the bottom of the glass, you might have these sediments. So in order to take these sediments out, they can use gelatin, icing glass, casein to remove these sediments. Also, if there's a bad harvest, there's other things that could be put into it in the fermentation, like white sugar. And in some cases, I know this sounds really, really gross, but it can be used It blood to give it that certain color that it should. So those are just some of those ingredients that can be used in winemaking. How do we know if a wine is vegan? There is no transparency on that yet. There's, you will have some wine bottles that say vegan friendly, but that begins only at the filtering part, not in the soil, not in the vineyard. I know in Italy, they're, they're v, they're, with their vegan signal, it's very, they're more strict than anywhere else that I've seen. So I did, that's how I found out that not uh, the corks, and I never thought about it, but also the corks, the binding, the honey, they use beeswax to um, bind the corks a lot of times. So they're, they're even strict with that. So that was very good to see that we do have some of the vegan symbols, the bee symbols on the bottles that you can trust when you see that, that the, the wines are 100% vegan from the soil up. But in the States, we don't have that certification yet. So that's why I do what I do. And I visit every um, vineyard and make sure that there's no animal products used from the soil up. And then you will see our logo on our on the back of the wine label. So that's how we're trying to be able for it to be more accessible to people without people having to, to, to just help them find the vegan wines along the way. Can you take us through the process of certification as far as you're concerned? When we find a, venue, a winery or a winery, we do have wineries that are approaching us now. So we give them a, a basic question and answer. And if they pass it within those our guidelines, then we, we do the visit. Because to me, I also see vegan wines and veganism. Uh, also, how do you treat your workers? And if you do have animals on your vineyard because some of them will you know have few goats or something like that let's say with the the grazing of the of the vineyard they use sheep and our thing is okay what happens to those sheep afterwards when they retire is it that they're going to become food then that already takes away from the the wine being vegan because you're doing we i feel like this if we're going to do it let's do it the right way just to 
for transparency as well. You know, um, I do get a lot of conflict with the sheets um, because it is people feel the natural way versus the machine. And I'm okay with that. But what happens to the animals afterwards? How are you caring for them during this process? And then after that, uh, we go so and I talk with the winemakers or the vineyard masters because sometimes they'll have to get their grapes somewhere else. The winemakers, they're not the, they're, they're not the grape growers and the winemakers. And then after that, we, we, well, we know we taste the wine because the wines have to taste good as well. The last thing I want is for someone to taste one of the wines and be like, oh, it's too sweet. That's why I don't like vegan wines because they don't taste good. We mm. want them to, uh, <laughs> you know, we, I, want, I want a wine to be accessible to everyone, not just vegan. And then after that, we start the process of coordinating to um, get the wines to us at a specific date. But we're very strict on our guidelines. And we do, we have had wineries that are vegan friendly on their label. And when it comes to our guidelines, they don't pass it. So we are very strict with that. And we, we just, again, we just want to create transparency. So our certification is for transparency. And also to help the winemakers that are doing it right, to keep promoting those because we feel if it keeps growing, then, then winemakers will keep changing their ways too because it will be in demand. Now, what is the reaction from the winemakers? Well, I first, when I first started doing this, they'll look at me like I have four eyes, five eyes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and and I still get hesitation. I still get hesitation at sometimes when I approach them, not when they approach me. But I feel that once I explain to them why I'm doing this and what we're trying, why we're trying to support them, then they change. Because a lot of them aren't vegan. We only have a few that are vegans themselves and one turn plant based um, afterwards. So we mm. always tell them. Not vegan yet, but um, they, we, I, like before when COVID hit, we were going to go back to Chile and meet up with all the winemakers at one dinner table, all the ones that we work with. And we want, and they're small winemakers, their business, and we are small too. So we want to grow together. But I would say that now with veganism and plant-based growing, that winemakers now are more open to talk about it and and make some changes. So I do see the difference in between when I first started going in 2016 till today. And that part is, is great. What is the most challenging response that you've received from a winemaker? The most challenging one, I would say the soil. We have different ways sometimes of looking uh, how, we're organic farmers ourselves, so we see how things grow, and we have seen winemakers and vineyard masters that don't use any animal products, not because they're vegan, just because they believe they don't they don't have to, and their wines are great. They taste beautiful. So that's the, the challenging part for me. When you're trying to convince or share your thoughts with someone that is so much into their beliefs on farming, that they um, use the word vegan. That's why, you know, you vegans, you know, you're so persistent on certain things. And that that is what I'm still trying to overcome without having them feel like I'm trying to, you know, like challenge them on a different level. It's just trying for them to see that there is another way. If you think about it, right, they've been doing this, some of them have been doing this for generations. And then you come in and you say, oh, by the way, don't put cow manure in your soil. What's that reaction like? Like, what do you know about wine? Did you go to wine school? <laughs> Did you go to farm school? <laughs> uh, like, you know, I, I get it. You know, when when you're farming, you, you have your certain beliefs. If you've been doing it for years, you might not see it that way. And then also, 
it costs a lot of money to change everything. Yeah, I mean, if you have a vineyard and all of a sudden you have to change the way you're farming, it's, it costs a lot of money. But now with climate change, I mean, I think they're forced, a lot of them are being forced anyway to change their ways. Now, what do you learn from that experience? My favorite part is the vineyard. And I love learning all the time. You know, when I first found out that wines were not vegan, that not all wines are vegan, I didn't know anything about a vineyard except that they look pretty, you know, when mm-hmm. they're in harvest season. I didn't know that if you, that fertilizing a vineyard is not as needed as people believe. You know, the, the wines, the vineyards, the roots actually are better with, they, they are better with stress. The roots go more down. They are able to survive on their own. They don't need all those fertilizers. So I learned I learned something all the time, and that fascinates me. I want the next thing I wanted to do is go actually out there and harvest with the winemakers, do the and the vineyard masters. So I'm always learning something different all the time, and I love it. Can you tell us how the finding process? is involved in winemaking, especially like the egg whites and the Isinglass? Well, I mean, that's what they use for the filtering. Take us through how some how a winery makes their wine. They do the harvesting. They bring it in. They crush all the, the grapes. And some, some will age the the wine with the um, the process with the seeds, I mean the skins in them, some, some of them won't, it depends. And then with the, the filtering process, whatever they use from the egg whites or benedite clay, benedite clay is, it's vegan, or just patient. So some, like, let's say there's a winemaker ohm in Chile, he doesn't use anything for his filtering. He uses patience. So he'll put his wine in a barrel for 16 months. So that's just, you know, you just got to wait after harvesting and, and the making and another 16 months on top of it before you're able to pay, to get that vintage, that um, the wine from that harvest. So it, the process is always different with every winemaker. But it is always either the fining or the non-fining. So they don't have to use the fining process? No. No, not at all. It's actually the fining process with the icing glass and the casein. And they're more for speed. Mm. It gets everything out, gets those wines bottled a lot quicker. And that's why a lot of the larger wineries use that process. I get scared when I hear, you know, well, we make about 400,000 bottles a year. I'm like, whoa, I know there's not patience in that as far as no finding at all, no filtering at all. How do you decide who you would like to partner with? The whole experience on, on my visit with them and their story on why they're doing it. Um, their love for their vineyard, their winemaking. And I always like to ask, what's the intention? And I, I like to answer, too, what's my intention with why do I want their wines? And I like to ask them, too, what's your intention with your wines? What do you, where do you see yourself going? So, and where do you want to end? And also the practices that they use. A the lot of ones that were working with are getting into the whole climate change certification as well. The eco environment, they're doing what they can to make everything better. And their passion and love for the wine itself. I I don't want to just sell wines. I want to I want to I want people to understand it from the beginning to the end, like why are these winemakers doing what they're doing and I, that's how I choose, like, which ones do I want to support? Which ones of vegan wines want to support and keep growing with? It's not just, like, because we need a Chardonnay in our portfolio. Yeah, we, we, if you look at our, our portfolio, we don't have a Chardonnay. That's, um, it's hard for us to find that, that 
that Chardonnay that fits within our guidelines because I have to visit every vineyard and COVID, of course, put a little slowdown on everything. Um, mm. But it, it, it's mostly of the story and the why they're doing it and the how um, that makes, that helps decide. Now, what is involved in creating a partnership besides you obviously said you have to go visit the winery? Well, up to date, it would be me and them working out the numbers. Uh, but now, thank goodness, we've hired someone on the team that is in more into the numbers, has a lot more experience in years. So that will help out because a lot of these winemakers that we're the ones that we're importing with the so importers of in this in the state. So this is their first time importing to the states, and this is my first time importing their wines to the states. So it's like a learning process together. Um, once we get all the logistics put together, and I know that they can supply a certain amount of wine per year for our for us over years, and that pretty much is it. They get to visit us here too in New York. Well, we have a extra apartment here that is not of state. <laughs> it's in <laughs> Manhattan. <laughs> and uh, when they come, we encourage them to come and we encourage them to stay there so then they could see also where their wines are going and also if the if the restaurants or or someone else, you know, we can do wine tasting classes or wine tasting events, anything. But um I, you know, our thing is always to make it a, a partnership beyond just the business, but to be, you know, like a personal business partnership. You're involved in the community. You're a part of Women of the Vine and Spirit. You've sponsored conferences like the Plant Based World Expo and founded VegFest Puerto Rico. What is it about being part of the community that is important to you? You always want to share everything um, that you can. I want to, I've been a vegan for so many years and honestly, I never thought in my lifetime that we would be where we are today with veganism and plant-based foods. So I love to encourage that as much as possible. And I love going into groups that are not vegan and that I can show them or answer any questions or just show them a different side that they might just see in the media about us, um, that we're, you know, the, they can ask me anything. I don't care. Just anything that will help them understand veganism or plant-based food that I can help them with or assist them with. And also with like with the veg fest, any, any farmer, any, uh, like, let's say there was this lady that she, she now owns a restaurant, but she was doing the farmer's market every every Sunday in Puerto Rico. And then after Hurricane Maria, she she does crepes and she would do them goat milk. And I was like, I, I would love to see if you can maybe use coconut milk and, and for this event and just um, sell them. It's free. You don't have to pay anything for the table. I just, you know, want as many vegan products in the event as possible. And she mm-hmm. was like, well, I can't do that, but I will do it in the farmer's market and I will try it out first. And now, and after that, she was doing it with coconut milk for, for a long time. Now she opened up a restaurant. She has about four dishes, four vegan dishes on her menu that people just love. So I feel like if I can open more doors like that, then I am the happiest person in the world. <laughs> How does that make you feel when you've changed somebody to that extent? I feel like I feel great because I feel like I did something that could go and keep going, you know, beyond what she just did that day. You know, she, she now has these four dishes on the menu and now someone might taste it and be like, okay, plant-based is not so bad. Let me give it more of a try. So it keeps going and going. And I love that feeling. What is it about women's empowerment and veganism that is so important to you? One thing I found out when I went into the wine industry is that uh, women, uh, it's, the wine industry is very much male dominated. Mm-hmm. So um, being a vegan, you know, we're always, like it was always we have to uh, try to, 
to try ways to blend in without, um, it just felt like that the, I had the veganism and the woman, the, 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 the male dominance both in the, together, which was like, wow, okay, I'm getting double hit on this one now. So the more I learned about the women in the wine business, the more um, I wanted to become part of that helping and supporting and, and getting support from them as well for the women empowerment. I mean, it goes, it goes beyond what I thought about before with the veganism, you know, which mm-hmm. I, in other industry now I see where else is needed. So I'm not saying veganism is male dominated, but just how veganism is, you know, the minority compared to everything else. <laughs> well, veganism is a feminist issue, right? If you, if you look at it at the base level, the cows are being exploited, the female cows, yeah. the female yeah. chickens. So it makes sense that that would be something that would be important to you as far as a women's empowerment and veganism issue. Yes, yes, 100%. And being a mother myself, you know, um, it, it, it always baffled me how much as a young mother that I was so encouraged instead of giving my own milk to my kids that I should go and get formula from cow's milk at the supermarket instead. So yes, that um, it started out from a young age learning about all that. Yes. <laughs> now, how did you decide to start your companies? When I went to France and, and during a wine tasting event, I heard the word egg whites and that's, you know, how I found out that that, that was the beginning of that journey of finding out. But also I found when I, I said, Oh, when I go back to the States, we got this, we know we're going to know about vegan wine. And when I went, I came back home, I Googled it. I saw that there was nothing out there for vegan wine. Hmm. Um, I went to restaurants and I asked the sommeliers. They didn't know. They thought it, a lot of them, I would say 99% of them at that time were saying the same thing. Oh, I thought it was just great. I went to wine schools. They did not have any education. And I was like, okay, I can't be the only one. So I Googled veganwines.com. It was available. And I was like, that's my calling. I got to start this. And I did. I mean, I didn't go to wine school. I learned from the winemakers and the vineyard masters. But I knew one thing. I knew, I know veganism. So, Mm -hmm. and I know that, and that is what led to starting it. How and when did you transition to a plant-based diet? Over 25 years ago, I was 23 when I became vegan. It was a very interesting uh, way of learning about opening up the door of, of seeing food a different way. But it's been over 25 years. What was it that made you think about going plant-based at that time? A friend of mine showed me a video and... It was um, more of a documentary of what, how people use animals in other countries for tradition purposes. And I don't want it to go into very gruesome details, but it was horrifying, very horrifying. I was crying during the video. And I turned to my, the, my friend was vegan. They were trying to show me. And we didn't have any videos like what the health and stuff like that back then. So the video he showed me was very graphic. And I said to him, I'm eating animals out of tradition. I'm doing the same thing that they're doing out of tradition. I'm eating animals out of tradition. So what makes me, I was like, I felt like in the bottom of the earth at that moment. I was like, I am the worst person ever. I'm eating animals out of tradition. And that was it. I just changed. I couldn't even look at meat on my plate anymore. And it was totally different. I saw what it actually was. So take us back to that day. You see this video and you have that reaction. Did you stop eating meat instantly? Yes. Yes, I stopped. I couldn't. I, I, I said to myself, okay, so I'll, um, I'll stop eating red meat. And then I remember my mom put chicken in front of me. So she cooked all the time. She couldn't put it in me. I, was, I couldn't eat it. I just, I couldn't. I didn't know what to eat because that's all I'm Puerto Rican. That's all we, you know, we know well at that time. And, 
So it was uh, it was challenging at first, but I and I wasn't eating healthy. I mean, I was not eating meat, but I wasn't eating. I was eating rice. I was eating you know, hmm. some tomatoes. I I had to learn all over, like learn how to eat. How challenging was that to learn how to basically start over? It was challenging at first. I'm also not a cook. So um, my mom always cooked for me. So it was challenging at first because I didn't, I, w- I was born and raised in, you know, in a neighborhood that you pretty much stood there all the time. So you didn't like, like I didn't know about Indian food. I didn't know about Mediterranean food. Um, I just knew Hispanic food. And uh, I would go to, in Puerto Rico, I would say, okay, I want um rice and beans and then I found out that beans a lot everybody does put meat in it I'm like okay Mm -hmm. so I'll have rice and when I asked for a salad back then in Puerto Rico it would be just lettuce and tomatoes but Mm -hmm. then um I started just uh just looking um you know reading and looking and seeing okay Mediterranean food has vegan food and then I found out that you know Chinese restaurants you know you have Chinese restaurants and and all the the neighborhood and I and actually know okay instead of sauteing this veggie can you you know steam it with some rice but it opened up a you know, whole new door I, I started getting excited about it because I was like oh my gosh it tastes so good I had hummus for the first time in my life mm. um, <laughs> it's just like hmm. it, I, I tasted food all all you know it was all different and then um, I had to lie at first in Puerto Rico, I tell lie and say I was allergic to meat because if not, they'll keep they'll they'll find a way to just tell me no, no, and just take out the ham out of the beans. Like I wouldn't be able to taste. It. I'm just like I don't. I just I'm allergic to it. But I don't have to say any bad anymore because now we've blossomed so much into plant based in Puerto Rico. I'm just talking about those first days, which was so many years ago. But I'm the more I learned about different types of national, like other nationalities that had already vegan food, plant-based, plant-based food out of their traditions, it became a whole new world. I was loving it. Did you struggle with anything as far as like, what did your parents think or your friends when you first went vegan? Yeah, I did. I've always been very determined though. And people know when I make up my mind, that's it. So nobody really tried to talk me out of it. But my mom, sometimes she still looks at me and is like, do you want co- um, milk in your coffee? But, but um, you know, there's a phrase in Spanish, you go, ay bendito, which means like, oh, you poor soul, something, you know, I like that. And that's, you know, when I say I'm a vegan, they're like, oh, bendito. And I'm like, no, I'm, I should be saying that to you, you know. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> So it was, it was challenging that people didn't understand um, about it. So I would, I stopped talking about it. You know, I, I still wouldn't. I know I've been a vegan and will always be a vegan, but I didn't put it into people's faces. I see, I saw people shut down. I see their face hurling. Hey, friends, how are you doing today? And then I'll start talking about veganism. It's like I trying to change the religion. So um, I closed down a lot and it just became my own little world. And I would be all excited when I first met my the uh, another vegan. I was like, oh my gosh, thank you. Or I'll go to retreats that were plant-based, but they were very hard to find, but I was determined to find them. So I felt like an outsider um, at first, but um, then I just said, okay, we'll go out to eat together. You can eat whatever you want, but just also respect what I'm about to eat as well. But it changed during the years. You know, people have become more acceptable for it. And now they'll be like, okay, we'll go to the vegan restaurant. You know, let's take me there. I'm going to go visit New York and I want you to take me there. So it's, it's changed a lot. Very happy about that. What did you learn from that struggle of having people shut down like you were changing their religion? And for you to stop talking about it. Lonely. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it just, um, especially our, you know, with um, in our neighborhood, it was, and I'm back in Puerto Rico, we're all, everything revolves, and I'm sure in a lot of 
um, nas- you know, nationalities. Uh, it's everything is revolved around food. You know, your whole family sits around, and then, you know, I had to say, okay, I can't go. I'm sorry, I can't see that pig in the middle of of the table. I, I'm sorry, I have to decline. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, you're not going to the family dinner. Um, so it felt lonely at that in that part, uh, but I wasn't going to also hurt myself in order to make someone happy when I know that they, what they were doing with that animal on the table is wrong. How did you overcome that? Uh, I, so one of the things that I started doing is like, the, okay, um, I'm not going to go to when you have that on the table, but if it's not a non-vegan, um, you know, like let's say I'm, I can't go for Thanksgiving. I know what's going to be there. I did try it once, though. I, I will. I forgot about this. And my parents are having the Thanksgiving dinner and they have, you know, the turkey on the table. And there's this vegan um, restaurant in Teaneck, New Jersey. And I and they were making these um, turkeys out of tofu, but they stuffed it like they were they were. In, in the way for, as, a, as a turkey. So I put my turkey next to my parents' turkey. That was the first attempt that I ever tried to be part of Thanksgiving dinner, but it didn't work too well because the turkey was still there. And I was like, yeah, that doesn't work. But what I did was that I said, okay, I'll go to some family events, but in return, can we please do Thanksgiving my way? And what I would do is I would... Um, have everyone that I know that does a vegan dish, any you know, other chefs, and I'd be like, okay, I want to order this, I want to order that, I want to order that, I want to order that, and I'll put it all in the spread on the table, and I'm like, you guys got to get full with this. I mean, if you don't like this, we got that. If you don't like that, you got this, and that's how I did it, and then our Thanksgiving became vegan. Um, that was my, that that's how I try to find some balance out of it. What's one thing that's really exciting you right now with your business? That I can use the platform to educate and support other small businesses like, you know, the cheese and wine pairing. So we have a thumb on our, our team and she'll take three of Miyoko's cheese and pair them with our wine for the wine club shipment. So the experience that we're able to give the people in our platform uh, when we partner with uh, chefs as well or, or anything. I try always to find other vegan businesses that um, we can collaborate with to bring that experience to people's homes with the wine club. And it's just people are always you'd be surprised at how many people don't know vegan, non-vegan of what could go into a wine and, how the, the small winemakers, they're, um, they're not as highlighted as they should be or, or, you know, people don't know too much about them. And I love to be able to support the, 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 those winemakers. I mean, a lot of them are farmers themselves with the vineyards. And it's mm-hmm. very important that, you know, we use every aspect of our business in order to go forward, but also to... I just want to create transparency as much as possible to our platform. And every time that I see that we've um, changed something like, Oh, I didn't know that not all wines are vegan. And, or I didn't know that I would love this wine that has sediments in it. I didn't know that that won't change the the way it tastes. I mean, I love seeing, uh, hearing those remarks. Yeah. It excites me. What is it about wine that makes you so passionate? It has a story. Every wine has a story. Uh, it's a beautiful story. Um, well, the ones that we work with, uh, the ones that I know of. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel my my biggest, the part that I love the most is being in the vineyard and talking with the vineyard master and the winemaker. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that is my favorite part. It all begins there. And, and then, you know, just the, the work that they go through, like, like there's another one, Moretta Wines, they're both pregnant, they're friends from childhood, 
and they're both pregnant at the same time and they're both harvesting and just to see so you know the smile in their face and what are they creating for their future generations i mean all those the wine story is what i love the most where did you get the courage to start your project there was a need for it and i i felt like um if i already thought about it somebody else thought about it in the world so we just need it here in the state so i and the more that i went out and asked questions the more i felt like there was so much more than just that filtering process and it just i loved it i fell in love with it and i wanted to share it with the world sounds like you really like finding great wine i do i really do i i get so excited when i my nose just takes all those aromas in it and the taste of it uh, uh, it's just so beautiful what they've created. Uh, I, uh, yeah, it's just, it's an overall beautiful experience. And to know that no animals were hurt in order to produce this wine that tastes so beautiful, that's what I want people to taste, that they don't, they don't need all that, all that cruelty and all those harsh chemicals and ingredients in the wine. To, you, want, you want a wine that can express itself through nature and and that's what I love about it. What cookbook or book or documentary have you gifted or recommended most to someone transitioning to a plant-based diet? What the hell? Just because it helped change my partner into veganism. Um, that was that was the last thing that he needed to see, and he, uh, he just changed overnight as well. So I have a lot of belief in what the hell. Finally, can you give me one word to describe how you felt before you became vegan and one word to describe how you feel now that you are vegan? One word before. Selfish. Um, And afterwards, understanding. Selfish and understanding. Perfect. Yeah. Becoming vegan opened up so much, so many a ways of thinking and you you get to better understand the world and people and animals i mean you never saw them the way you see them after you're you become vegan you know you get to see them as a living soul just like you just like us such a pleasure speaking with you thank you so much for taking the time what is the best way for people to follow you and support you on instagram the web and social media in general our social media handle is my vegan wine for instagram and facebook and our website is veganwines.com and if any ever have any questions info at veganwines.com as well is a good way to reach me. Thanks again, Francis, for being on Plant Your Seed. Thank you, Fred. It was great conversation. Thank you so much. Hope you are inspired by this story. And remember, it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.